Jason Caldwell is the nothing personal word of the day. We have a Samson sit down and we've got Jason Caldwell, the star of the great documentary that I just reviewed called Chasing. Jason Caldwell, the man who does things that an endurance athlete like myself can only dream about. And we've got him for you for 45 minutes. Jason, welcome to Nothing Personal. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks, David. Looking forward to this. I have so many things I want to get to, but I'm going to start with baseball because that is really, to me, is how your career started. And the end of baseball was the start of the journey of your life, or some would say that baseball began the journey of your life. How do you decide? I've spoken to minor league players and to college players about this a lot. How do you decide when you were done that that's it, you'd had enough? Well, I mean, it, it wasn't complicated at the time because I was a kid, you know, I was in my mid 20s and there was this sense of kind of relief when I got injured. And that was a weird thing for me to to be feeling, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in the doctor's office. They're talking about Tommy Johns. They're talking about a year of rehab. You know, coaches are kind of rolling their eyes. Oh, boy, here we go. They've been they've been through this many times with other athletes it almost felt like it was like an easy exit and that sounds, that sounds wrong, but that's just how I felt this sense of relief that the pressure was off. Um, you went through I, so many times though on the documentary and where, where a lot of it had to do with your dad Yeah. and once you were hurt, but still in baseball, Tommy John, it's not like the old days and you're not old. There is coming back from Tommy John and in theory, and we'll talk about this maybe later, that there's more money in baseball than in rowing, but we don't know that for sure. But all of that said, when you think it's a sense of relief, did you not like baseball that much that you were just, hey, let me just hurt my arm so I can move on to something else? I don't think it was that, but, you know, the reality was I just wasn't the best on the team. You know, I constantly was fighting. Um, you know, to make a starting rotation, to get time, you know, I was just, guys were throwing harder than me, guys had more control that, than I did, I was left, I was a left hander, and I did throw hard, and I was tall, so that gave me a better look than a lot of others, but I struggled, and it was, it was an uphill battle my entire career, and, you know, to bring in my dad, I say in the documentary, I thought I loved baseball, but I loved my dad and he loved baseball. And I think that's very true. Of course, you don't think about that stuff when you're young, but you get older and you realize that a lot of my love for baseball was my love for going to Candlestick Park on a cold Friday night after school, you know, um, with my dad because he had season tickets. Um, you know, my love for just listening to the radio in the garage while we were tinkering around, but a lot of it was with my dad, you know, so I had trouble disassociating those two things. But I think if we're going back to like, how do we know whether to push on or, 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 or quit? I think these days I kind of, I measure these two things and those two things are suffering and sacrifice. I think we measure those two things all the time without knowing it. But when I'm making tough decisions these days, whether it's in business or it's what what next adventure am I going to do? I'm measuring, you know, how much am I going to have to suffer in order to prepare and then do this thing? And that could be physical suffering, but also mental and emotional suffering as well. And then what am I going to have to give up? And, you know, we're measuring those things constantly. And that's what I'm doing is those thresholds move based on where I am with my life and all that kind of stuff. But I think as a kid, that's what I was I was measuring without knowing that was I don't think I was willing to go through that suffering again of having to rehab, watching my team get ahead of me once again, missing another season, all this type of stuff just to have to come back. It just, to me, didn't seem worth it. But you were a lefty. Do you know how many years we spend trying to scout and find tall lefties <laughs> who can throw hard? I'm just I saying that if you teach, if you want your child to be a baseball player, the first thing you do is teach him how to throw lefty. I know, I know, I know. Well, I where were you when I was 24? I needed you there. Wait, what year did you have that? What year was this? Yeah, I'm gonna, it says it in the doc, and I think this was 2003, I think. That's the year we won the World Series. I was the president of the Marlins winning the World Series. And let me tell you something, we needed lefties. We would throw out Miguel Tejera. And I don't want to <laughs> say anything bad about Miguel Tejera, but come on, you could have been that guy. Well, so the base of this all comes down to you let me down. You, you know, There's you no know. doubt. 
And, and by the way, I was probably at Candlestick watching games and looking around thinking, God, is there any way to make our team better? And I should have just looked in the stands and said, look at that little gangly lefty who's throwing hard and miserable the whole time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, well, you know. Maybe next that. time. Yeah, next may, time. May, maybe, maybe you will help me scout other lefties who you know. Maybe I can go to a rowing club and find big lefties. That's what you got. Yeah, exactly. Guys Does being a lefty around. matter when you're a rower? Not really. It'll depend on, it'll make it when you start rowing, what side you're more comfortable in the boat, starboard or port. But generally speaking, you'll get used to something that won't much matter. Can we teach our audience that port means left? And you know that because there's four letters in port and four letters in left. Is That's that how you learned it? Well, in rowing, you make it worse because you're sitting backwards in the boat. So port to, on a rowing boat is actually to your right. Sailing, you're right. It's absolutely to your left. But when you're turned around in the boat and you're sitting in the boat going that way, it actually makes a diff it, it changes it up. So it's like acting. It's stage left. Stage exactly. left is this audience is, now right. We're, now we're getting into math. And that's something we should both probably steer clear of. <laughs> oh, no. Come on. I want to do math with you. That's how I do all the endurance events I've ever done involve math because i'm always calculating the number That's of hours i have left the number of miles i have left don't tell me you did not do math while rowing across the atlantic ocean that's all, that's all you're doing is you're right. all calculating your new speed what's that going to do project that out and oh my gosh yeah it gets maddening but it's simple math at least so it's it's simple math although when you're exhausted and when you when your body hurts to the point of night sweats when you have not slept you're not eating properly except astronaut food and you know you're in the middle of this 50 to 70 day journey uh the math can get very complicated that's very true i mean it's unbelievable how hard it is to do simple math when you're that sleep deprived so what you row across the ocean for people go watch the show once you listen to this and if after the review on nothing personal you haven't watched it then shame on you watch this documentary called chasing but when you decide that you are going to do something what order do you have because i had a family too when i was doing seven marathons in seven days on seven continents or doing the iron man or some of the other crazy stuff i've done what order do you do in your thought process before you decide to do it? Do you talk to family first, your wife, your girlfriend? Do you think about family? Do you think about the physical toll, the time to train, the, the possibility of failure? Tell me about your, your order. I'm fascinated by that. Yeah, the order's changed because, you know, when I first decided to do my first crossing, I was, you know, I was in a relationship, but we weren't engaged yet. I wasn't married, certainly didn't have any kids. Now I'm married with a kid, three-year-old, you know, things change now. So it was, a, you know, my order was, do I want to do this? Do I think I can do this? And then we go. I didn't really ask anybody any permission. And then, um, but now it's different. Now it's a conversation that I have with my wife. My boy is only three, so he's not part of that conversation, but he's certainly a part of the equation. Um, and I've always said that if my wife says no, like if, if, if she doesn't feel comfortable with this, then we're not going. And uh, do you mean that actually? Only 50%. Okay. I thank yeah. you for your honesty because yeah. most athletes don't want to be that honest. I appreciate that you're saying that you go to your wife first or go to your family first, but there's something about an endurance athlete. Yeah. There is a pull to the event that is so strong that it's very hard to deny once the pebble gets into your brain. 100%. So I'm not going to pretend that, you know, if we, uh, you know, if she says, ah, not this one, we're going to go, there's going to be a conversation. So, um, and that's what happened between my first row and second row. My first row had, you know, devastating consequences. We didn't win the race. We didn't break any kind of world record. Um, and I, and I know I need to do it again. And I remember the first time I said, I think I got to do this thing again. She listened and she's, she's a good listener. And I went on a business trip. I came back and she said, no, nah, I, I don't want to do this again. You know, I don't, I don't want to go through this again. And uh, obviously I did do it again. So it became a conversation. It wasn't, it's, uh, it's not going to be a something where I'm going to say, well, I'm doing it whether you like it or not. You know, I don't want, I don't want that, but you're right. Once the seed's planted, it's very difficult to extract that and just you, to forget. You said a word that I want to, I want to push back a little bit. You said devastating consequence. I believe Coco will tell me if I have this wrong, a devastating consequence of not winning or getting the world record. Is that, do you go into an event saying that's a devastating consequence? It was on that one. It's no longer a devastating consequence. But for that one, my first row, 
was all about proving to myself and everybody else that I was better than a wall full of silver medals, so to speak. You know, baseball doesn't work out. I didn't, I didn't qualify for the Olympics when I was on the elite team. I was small for, I'm small for rowing. I'm 6'4", 220, and I'm small. Um, you know, and so Wait, does that mean I can't row? I'm five five one thirty. You can row lightweight. You're actually a perfect lightweight. So yes. that's perfect. You, you can nail it. Yeah. Can I row across the Atlantic at five five? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, it, you, we'll talk. But we can we can put our our next team together with you. So you would never have me on your team. Your team was full of strapping strong <laughs> men who would like to be naked like in the ocean. I'm this small little guy, but I could do it for 70 straight days. There's no question about it. But you would never, you totally discriminate against short people when it comes to ro putting your team together, don't you? Well, I used to, that's what I'm saying. The first row, it was about that proving. I want to break a world record. I want to show everybody that, that I can do it. And now that I've got world records, it's more about, it's different. My, my why is different. The reason why I do these are different. It doesn't, it's not no longer devastating if I don't break a world record. It's just not. I mean, I've already proven to it. It's just the macho-ness has gone out of it now for me, for these types of rows. It becomes about, it's a, I like being different when I get done with these things. And you know this, when you give all of yourself to something, you're just a changed person. It's just the way it goes. You know, I'm different than I was when I push off the shores of the start line uh, and, and La Gomera or through the Golden Gate last year for the Pacific. I'm different now as a result of just putting myself, you know, giving all of myself to it and to the, to my teammates. That's what I like now. And, and I, I, I want to be different and I want to, I want to understand myself a little bit. How lonely is it? And, I, and I'm asking because for what I do, and I don't do anything near what you did, but I just did a marathon on Kilimanjaro and uh, the highest marathon ever. And I do all these things and I can't get anyone who hasn't done it to understand why I do it. And it becomes very lonely. And, and what you do to me, forget the lonely part of the actual event that you do. How do you actually, when you're home, reintegrate like re-entry to me is a, is a word that i use i don't know if you use that after one of these races one of these events re-entry is when you have to become quote unquote normal again and i find it to be incredibly hard is your adjustment hard after your races i love this topic and it's a great question i mean i'm hearing two questions actually i'm, I'm hearing what, what it's like to yeah to kind of re-engage with life after doing something that no one has any concept of what you just went through. So that, that, and then also, is it lonely? So is it lonely? Yes. I remember this, there was this like point after my first row, you know, 51 days out at sea, I come back to my, my hometown I'm in the Bay area, smaller town and I'm bearded. I got a huge beard at this point. I've lost 40 pounds. I don't even look like myself. I'm, you know, it's, it's, it's February. So everyone's pale and I'm tan. And I remember walking into the, our local coffee shop and, and the lady that rings me up every morning does not recognize me. And I, I was like, it was, I, I, I didn't even say anything. I was like, oh, that's interesting. She does not know it's me. And I just sat down there with my coffee and I just like watched people come in and out. These are the same people I saw every single morning. I don't know most of these people, you know, but you just recognize the faces. And I remember thinking like, while I was out there, they had Christmas, they had New Year's, they opened up gifts, they had time with their family. And most likely they will not remember that Christmas in a couple of years. They won't know. Well, was that that Christmas or was it two years ago? And I will absolutely 100% remember those 51 days at sea. And it was just an, it, it that's a feeling of loneliness is like, they have no clue what I just did and it's okay. But even if someone wanted to sit down and say, what, what did you just go through? Where would you start? You know, like where, where would you start? And that, and that part is both, lonely and also it makes it difficult to reinsert yourself back to life because you have these people that say i don't understand but i want to please help me understand and that's that's a nice there's question. no way to do that though but at least they have the intention there whereas there's other people that just say you're crazy man i don't know why you do stuff like that it's almost like they don't mean it to be it but it's almost insulting it's like they that it's they just disregard it as being something like, I don't know, this guy's got too much time on his hands. I mean, I'm sure you've gotten that too, you know? And so it is difficult to make people understand your intrinsic why. And it kind of falls into two categories, people that aren't going to be able to understand it, but want to, and then people that aren't going to understand it and don't want to. And I get a lot of, it must be nice. Yeah. It must yeah, be yeah. nice to be able to do that. I mean, I got, I, I did this, 
it's one thing uh, they they filmed it and put on on you know youtube and stuff like that it was just like oh what does a guy like this what does he eat and all this stuff it, the comments were crazy i mean like 140,000 people viewed it and the con the comments are are largely positive but there's also negative people you know oh you're just white privilege and i was like wow like i i run my own company i struggle just like everybody else i had to give up a lot to do this with my family and my company i have a small little business here it's like but that's you know and that's that's okay like that's if that's how people feel i'm you know i it's it's false but it's okay you can't let the negativity get you down on social media or anywhere. And especially when you're doing what you're doing in the event that you're doing, you have to go into it knowing there's a very small sliver of people who can even understand, forget, appreciate, who can understand what you're doing, what your possible motivation could be other than ego, right? But that's, that's not it. You know, ego is a huge part of why I do what I do, but it's really testing myself, making myself unrecognizable. And you said something that I'd never thought of in all my years. When you finish an event, like finishing Survivor, I'd lost a lot of weight, but I'm always recognizable to other people, but sometimes I'm not recognizable to myself. And there are times after events when I'll, when I'll look at myself in the mirror, really, and also metaphorically, and say, what, what are you doing and why are you doing it? And I have to rethink my priorities and not saying I'm choosing family now or not. What I'm saying is rethink what is the foundation for the decisions I make when it comes to these events. You have to have done that multiple times and yet you keep coming to the same conclusion, which is, hey, I'm not done. I may not be winning anymore because I've changed my outlook, but I'm not done. Do you do that still? Yeah, you wanna talk about reflection. It's like the first crossing that took 51 days you know, I get back, we're in the Caribbean, that's the finish line. I've not really seen myself because I didn't have a mirror in the boat. And so I get back and you know what it's like. And, and I, you know, we, we finally get back to the, the, the little, you know, house that we're staying at. And I finally get a chance to look at myself in the bathroom mirror and I just start crying. Like, I had no idea this is what I looked like. It was just, it was basically what 51 days took from me. And it was, it was not, you know, I'm not like sad or anything. I'm just emotional. You know, it's just like, I've never seen myself this changed before. And now I'm not, now I'm knowing why my wife is crying when she's pulling me off the boat and seeing me and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, that, that part is, is difficult, but, um, you know, everyone says, Oh, now that you're married, I'm sure you'll stop this. No, now that you have a kid, I'm sure you'll stop doing this. It actually, it actually drives me further. My kid's only three. But in the next few years, he's going to slowly start to realize what his dad has done and is doing. And that is a motivation for me. He's going to be able to watch the doc and understand it. He's going to be able to read articles. He's going to hear from other people talk about his dad. And I want those things. I want him to be full of pride. And I want him to know that it's it's all up for grabs for this kid. It's all up for grabs. Let me forecast something for you, Jason, just because because I can't stop you from going through it because I promise you you're going to go through it. There will be people who will criticize your choices as a father, criticize the desire to be away from your family, say that that is equivalent to not wanting to be a good dad or not being a good dad. Your kids will have, your child, your son will have a moment as he's growing up that will be full of anger and resentment. Like you're not here, you're not around because there's something acute that happened that he couldn't share with you and wanted to share with you and you were unavailable. But you will live to see the day, God willing, and your child will grow up. And my children have grown up and as they've grown up, they have a totally different perspective of all the different things I've done that have kept me away from home, whether it's going to 160 baseball games a year, whether it's training for these races that I do that stop me even when I'm home from being home because I'm out training and it turns. And the, the, the level of closeness that I feel to my children as they get older and I see it manifesting in themselves. They don't want to do what I do. So it is very possible that your son will never row across the Atlantic. However, what you are giving him and what you are teaching him, he will use as he goes forward in his life where he will become very, very accomplished and you will have that feeling of, oh, guy, I didn't screw this up. And that's going to come for you, Jason, I promise. I appreciate you saying that. And I think, you know, I already see it in terms of other people saying that stuff. Some people, you know, I'm sure you feel the same way. Like they're not going to say it to my face necessarily because that's, you know, that's inviting 
a confrontation that they don't want, but it's still being said. I hear it. I hear it through this person, through this, you know, that person. And that's fine. That doesn't bother me. But, you know, I never really thought about it that way. Like that will, that will sting big time if and when my son has those. But um, knowing that it's going to happen, knowing that I had that same situation with my dad, we had our moment and, and on the dark side of the moon that I came around and we're closer for it now. We're, we're really close. Um, it gives me hope. But, but I appreciate you saying that because it's nice to be prepared for that. It's amazing to show kids or teach kids or teach people who you, when you give speeches, right? Motivational speeches, you're not really asking people to do what you did. You're asking people to do what they will do. And yeah. that's what you're motivating them to do. And many people miss that on the speech circuit. I know you're on the circuit. And one of the things that you do when you're motivating people, you'll agree you're not motivating them or asking them to row across the Atlantic, right? No, no, absolutely not. <laughs> I want them to see themselves in the stories that I'm telling. I want them to be kind of internalizing it the whole time while they're hearing me talk and saying, what about, I think one of my favorite things I, I do, I give a lot of talks around the world, but one of my favorite responses was I get this, after, a, you know, I get off the stage and I'm getting a lot of people talking to me and this one lady, I can tell she's been hanging in the background for a little while. And, I, you know, finally, I just invite her to come out, you know, to talk to me. And she says, like, I just want to share something with you. You know, she's, she's probably in her like late fifties, early sixties. She's got a twin sister that she was estranged from for years, but they eventually got re reconciled their differences and they did a century bike ride together. And the, she told me all about it, how they had to walk most of it, a lot of it because it was raining and it was uphill and they couldn't do it, but they finished. But she just felt inspired to just tell me that story. It had nothing to do with rowing. Had not, she wasn't trying to compare our two. It's just what she heard and what she thought about during my 60 minutes on stage. And it was just awesome. And that's, by the way, like if we're talking about the doc, we're talking about chasing, that's what I want. I want kids, but also adults. I want them to know that if for some reason the path you're currently on gets, you get, you know, it no longer is the path for you, whether because you're not good enough, you're not talented enough, you can't make it to the next level or it's injury or you don't want to, whatever it is, it's not over, you know? And, and by the way, I thought it was, you know, as, as, as relieved as I felt that, you know, maybe baseball wasn't my career. I, I was left no pun intended, like rudderless, you know, and that's, that's a scary, scary feeling for most of us is not being part of something bigger than ourselves. That's a, that sucks. And for people like us, you know, that want to be achieving at, at the highest level possible, not having that next goal is rough. And so, but there, there is, there's always opportunity. Do you feel when you're doing an event that you find yourself in your mind wandering to the next thing? How quickly I do that. And it's, it's very upsetting because I want to be very present when I'm doing things. And when, when I'm doing something from endurance, I'm, I'm thinking, all right, I'm going to get this done. Like I'm going to finish, I'm going to get there. And then what am I going to do? Like now what, isn't that crazy that we think that way? It is. But I, for those that are out there thinking that's nuts, I will, I will try to add, you know, a little bit of, uh, well, I'll try to make it make sense. I'll say, is that I feel with these big endurance and adventure endurance races that I do, it's all the, the prep is the hardest part. So it's like, it's the training, it's the team building aspect of it. It's getting all the logistics set up. A boat is incredibly complex to row across an ocean you, and it's unassisted. So everything that you need has got to be on there. When I push off, it's like, there is a sense of relief. I'm like, Oh, thank God. Now all I have to do is just suffer through the whole thing. But I, we already, it's already been, we're going to finish. We've already put in haze in the barn, so to speak, you know? So while I'm making these crossings, it's like largely I am already looking to the next one because although I am in the midst of, of, of taking this on, I feel like so much of the work has already been done. So that's, that's how I think I can at least justify it for people like us to start thinking about the next one before the first the, one. The metaphor I use is that every training run or every training day is like, a, is like putting a deposit into your bank account. And on race day or race week or race month, you are making a withdrawal. And in the races we do, there's an overdraft situation no matter what. It's just a matter of how big the overdraft is. And if you don't make the deposits, then your withdrawals, then you're screwed from the start. And it happened actually with, with your first crossing where you end up only two of your teammates made it. 
right? So, and it's not training because anything can happen during the course of a race and you have to be ready for a glitch or for something. So let me ask, what would you say in your crossings, something we may not have seen on the documentary, something that happened where you said, oh Christ, like we've got a problem here. I mean, obviously the evacuation, my first race, 600 miles into this 3000 mile row. I've got one guy who's sick. He's getting evacuated. It's going to take two to two and a half days for the sailboat to get to us, to get him off. But then having my, a second teammate say, I'm out, you know, I mean, even as optimistic as I am about our chances going from four, four man down to two is, this was a tough pill to swallow. Were you angry at the guy who quit? Oh, 100%. Are you still? Yeah, I am. I am still angry. Um, I'd like to say, oh no, water under the bridge, but it's not, it's not water under the bridge. And this is a, this is a constant conversation I have. Uh, we, we do this in our, you know, I teach at a couple business schools and we have a, we have like a little case study on it. It's, it's, is is did this man leave because he was unprepared? He was cowardly or did he, did, was he justified leaving because Jason didn't lead the, the team the way that they should be? Now, as far as that goes, I think that there's problems on both sides. I absolutely take ownership from my side, but he, he was unprepared, you know, and he was healthy when the boat came. He could have stayed and he didn't. Wait, you know, he was unprepared? Yeah, by the fact that, you know, we, you saw red, we saw red flags before we pushed off. We saw red flags in the So week. why did you push off with him? No, that's the, that's, that's where I take ownership. I had two, I had two things. I need to do at least one of two things when we were at the start line for two weeks and we saw the red flags. One, he no longer wanted to be on the team. Like he no longer wanted to be part of it. You could tell. And my job is the, is the captain was to get him back on, right? On board, get him back on board, want him to be part of our, our something greater. Or the other option was to give him a plane ticket home say we got this without you and i didn't have what it takes or what it took to to get him back on board and i didn't have the courage to give him the plane ticket either to be fair you know i'm being very honest with you right now i didn't have what it took on either side and i didn't think you could do it with three people as it turns out you can do it too <laughs> but uh that that was my that was my failing but you know he has to also look at himself and say you know was i prepared and you know another thing too is uh I think, you know, we never heard from him afterwards. He never contacted us during the row after he left. He never even contacted us when we finished. In fact, I got a text message from him two months after I got home saying, hope all is swell, and then proceeded to ask me for a favor, unrelated to the row, like as if we were never on a boat together. So that tells me that there's some deep-seated issues that he chose not to deal with as well. So I think there's problems on both sides. He is not 100% of the problem. Um, and neither am I, but you know, I don't think he was the right guy for the team. How far do I have to row before I'm allowed to say, I hope all is swell. Like what's the general rule? Because you can't just go to your gym and get on the rowing machine and then text your friend, hope all is swell. I didn't even know people still used the word swell to be fair. <laughs> I never but heard that Jason. I love it. I still have the text. I never responded to it. I was, I was, I was, I was, you ghosted him. I was two paragraphs deep into a pretty nasty text. And then my wife was the one who says, why don't you just give it a couple of days, which was great advice. And I just chose not to respond. So, yeah. I, I hope you're doing swell. When you're in the ocean, do you see one of the things that I didn't think was covered enough in the documentary for my crazy taste. I wanted to see some specifics like how the restrooms are working, like where are you going, how you're eating, how you're preparing the food. You showed the little cabin that you each have to be in, how many hours you're sleeping. But I also didn't see any fear like of animals or of, I didn't see huge storms. What was the most scared you were when you're, I'm picturing Tom Hanks and Castaway, right? In the middle of the ocean. Is that sort of what it's like? Yeah, I mean, the storms are big, and especially when in the year one with Hurricane Alex come passing over over us, they're big. I mean, the problem is, is, you know, the, you don't, it's not the first thing you think about. Turn on the GoPro when, uh, when, when you're faced with a big storm, you're talking about making sure everything's, you know, you're batting down the hatches, making sure that you can, you're not going to capsize or, or, or roll or anything like that. So, um, 
Yeah, I think weather is probably the thing that makes you most nervous. Weather at night is probably the thing that makes you most nervous. It's, you know, a lot of times it's a new moon or a cloudy night or the moon isn't, hasn't even risen yet. So you're talking about pure pitch darkness. Why are storms always at night? Isn't that weird? I, well, they happen that day, but they don't take it. It's like, oh, the sun's going down. Let's give them a break. We'll see you in the morning, guys. It's like, <laughs> just keep on going. I, and, and that and that being shrouded in that darkness where you can just see just basically just the outer limits of the boat it feels like you're on a on a rushing river it really does and your mind plays tricks with you feels a lot of times like I've had teammates that are absolutely certain we're rowing in circles and I know we're not because I'm looking at the repeaters and it says no we're holding our bearing we're good but it does it plays tricks with you at night and that that can be scary and there, there's that feeling all of a sudden that you're like there is nobody that's going to come and be able to get us if something happens. And one of the more sobering statistics that I read, thank goodness it was after my first row, was that most of the time when you're in the middle of the Atlantic or Pacific, especially in a small vessel like us, the next closest person outside, people outside your boat are at the International Space Station. <laughs> Hold on, I'm doing the math on that right now. Do the math on it. So it you're not in any shipping lanes of any kind? I mean, you, you are, at close to the start and to the finish, of course. Um, but you're going to follow the trade winds because you're a rowboat and you don't have an engine. So you're not taking the, you know, the, you're not taking the shortest distance. You're basically, you know, you're coming down, you're going Southwest and you're coming, you're making a big, basically a big J. And so the, the more in the middle of the ocean you are, the less chance for, because you could be separated by even just a hundred miles doesn't, you know, seems like a lot, but it's not really in, t in terms of the lanes get really wide out there and you're, you know, for boats. So yeah, at the start line, you're next to things, but you still don't see them. And at the finish line, of course, because everything starts to narrow as they're coming into land, but out in the middle, no. And think and about a hundred miles straight up. Yeah, I guess that's space. true. A hundred miles on the ocean is not much to talk about. What any any good animals other than whales and sharks, dolphins? Anything that any anybody jump in the boat? Any animals jump in your boat? Flying fish jump in the boat all the time. It's like shrapnel. I mean, there'll be times where you'll just see a whole school of fish that are in the air and then do 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 right against the boat and then hit you in the face. So yeah, I mean, I saw it all: whales, sharks, you know, sea turtles. You're, Dolphins, so many dolphins you don't even care anymore. Uh, when they're we were like the, we were in the they're finish like line in New York City, yeah, yeah, it was like we, we went on a little sunset cruise. Um, you know, we were in Hawaii after my last crossing, and everyone's like, Oh, there's all these dolphins on there. I didn't even get up, <laughs> I don't care, but yeah, I mean, you see it all big fish, Dorado, and we do get out of the water because assuming that weather allows you, you got to get out every five days or so and you need to clean the bottom of the boat because it actually gets build up barnacles and stuff build up on it you got to get that stuff off so i'd say if one of the most amazing experiences is there was a, a on one of my crossings we it was dead calm flat i'm talking like as flat as the floor you're sitting on right now and no wind no waves no clouds and you jump in and it's just silence it's like being in space and you're just thinking to yourself right now, there's 30,000 feet below me. I have no idea what's underneath me right now. And you sit there and it's for a moment, you, I just would swim down and just do a 360, like inside there, it's just dead silence. And it's just one of the most amazing experiences. It's terrifying. I'm not, you know, I mean, you're not supposed to, you're supposed to be tethered to the boat. I'm not, you know, I just want to be free. And then there's that second, you're like, oh my God, I got to swim back to the boat. It's going to leave me. But it's just an amazing feeling. And and then, of course, you you know, once you you can't stand there too long, you don't know what's out there. And but you know, that's just an incredible feeling. What about the salt water on all your open sores that you showed in the documentary that all of you get on your hands and feet? Doesn't that sting just a tad? Yeah, it does. It hurts, but it also cleans them out. And um, you know, you've got salt sores all over your body. You got your hands and feet, but you also got your your ass has got tons of salt uh, sores on it from just sitting for so long. So it's actually great to get out and that water and just kind of like it's yeah it's salt water bath but at least it's something and then you know if you've got a little extra fresh water that you don't need to use for drinking water being able to pour that on top of you after you get out is it's it's a game changer when you were filming the crossings were you aware there was going to be a documentary when you no. started or you just were filming for your own and then you put it together did you put the documentary together and then sell it or did someone come to you and say hey you're quite interesting let me see what footage you have 
kind of both. What ended up happening is um, we have that dramatic first crossing and the, the race had hired a film crew from London to, uh, to just interview teams. And uh, we weren't one of the teams that got interviewed, to be fair. No one really thought much of us. And then the race got delayed five days because of a storm, so they had nothing to do. So the film crew's like, let's try that lap- Latitude 35 team. Let's get the captain here. So I, I, I got and I was, you know, naive and arrogant and everything, all, all the things that us baseball players are. And, um, you know, but also got, you know, charisma. And I'm, I'm saying it like it is. And I'm saying we're going to try to break the world record. And, and this is, you know. A British film crew is like, oh, God, here we go again. And some American that. Those damn Americans. Yeah. But I did say at the end, I said, but hey, talk to me. And after the race, if I do it in 50 days, you can tell me I told you so. And he said, you know, I thought you were the, the film, uh, the producer there, the, uh, the, uh, the director said, I thought you were such an arrogant asshole until you said that line. But I was like, hey, he left the door open for, you know, he's, he's got some humility. Anyway, we have this dramatic crossing. We do it in 51 days, not 50. Um you know, two guys get evacuated and all of a sudden people find out Jason's doing it again. This guy, this, this, this director said, I cannot believe you're doing this again. This is amazing. I mean, after the beating you took to do this second time, the very next year, he said, I'd like to follow you and just like chronicle what you're, how you're going to rebuild this team. He did it on his own dime. No one was paying him for it. He just believed in the story. All of a sudden, I got this, you know, this guy that was a critic at the beginning of that one. Now, all of a sudden, he's like, let's see what he can do. Well, fast forward, we build a great team. We train a great team. We we make a great crossing. We turn 51 days into 35, break the world record the very next year. And now, all of a sudden, there's a story. Um, now, all of a sudden, people want to are interested. Well, he goes and makes his first cut of a dock. I get an investor. We get a little bit of money enough for him to make it again he's working for free his time is for free put something together we hold a little bit of a a little screening at my uh my hometown a little 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 movie theater that we have here and we're so shocked people love it i mean people just like the story is in is incredible and i just i was we were kind of surprised by the reaction you know and i was like yeah but these are all people in my hometown like of course they're gonna like it. it's about one of the one of their you know one of their 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 local people here well, didn't stop there. We made a few phone calls. All of a sudden, like Netflix is like, why don't you come down and talk to us about this thing? I was like, holy shit, are you serious? So again, we're just, we don't know. He flies in from London. I drive down to, you know, to LA. We, we meet with some people and then, you know, it starts getting a little bit of traction. And then all of a sudden, producer from Free Solo, Evan Hayes, it, uh, gets a hold of us. You know, we've been talking to him a little bit. He says... I don't usually take, you know, things that are already done. I start from the beginning, but he was inspired by the story as well. And he's like, I'll take it on. And he, along with his team and Simon, our director who originally believed in it, they made what you saw, you know, then they, we went, they went back and they, 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 you know, they, they, you know, we did more interviews and we got all that kind of stuff. And it's what you have. It was just, it was an awesome experience and people, onboarding and getting getting into it because they believed in the story you know he's not going to make any money really but it's it's amazing i think people will when they watch chasing which everyone should watch which is the story not just of jason caldwell rowing across the atlantic ocean it's the story of how you build a team it's a story of how you overcome obstacles that are what you would think are impossible to overcome and you can apply it to your own life Folks, you can apply it to your own life because not only can you not row across the Atlantic Ocean, because I can't, but I can watch that documentary and say, okay, the things that I do, I learn because of what Jason did and how he thought about things. So I don't know if you appreciate, Jason, the impact you're having on people because the relatability is what it's about with these documentaries because the wow factor, that sort of gets people in the door like, wow, this guy rode across the Atlantic Ocean. That looks sort of cool, but that's not what keeps them watching. What keeps them watching is when they can start internalizing and saying, ooh, I'm, I'm taking something away from this. And that's what chasing actually does for people. And I hope people are giving you that feedback. No, I appreciate that. I love it. And, and yeah, I am getting that feedback. It's like, you know, this wow to how factor that, that I, I've talked about. It's like, it's, it's not enough for a doc to just be wow, that was an amazing story. Wow, that's great. I think 
if you're going to tell a story, if you're going to be a documentarian and you're going to share your stories, you have to go to that how. So how does it apply to me now, the person that's watching it? How can I take what I just saw and apply it to my life and become a better friend, a better father, a better mother, a better employee, whatever it is? And I'm I'm hoping that's what it does. I've gotten great feedback you know, from people. It is, Jason, I promise you. Can we talk about business for one second, if you don't mind, in our remaining few minutes? You've been generous with your time. But one thing that I did not get to learn is what is the, what is the financial picture of this row? Because that boat, that's not like a regular rowboat. That seems to be a well-equipped rowboat. And I'm curious how you raise the money, what, the, what is the cost? If I wanted to row across the Atlantic Ocean, what kind of budget do I need? Yeah, do do not get into ocean rowing to make money. You will absolutely one hundred percent lose money. But, um, but uh, it's expensive. It's more expensive to you know than climbing Everest or anything like that. Um, those boats are expensive. You're talking six figures easy just to get the boat and the mounted equipment on the boat. Then you've got the loose equipment, the food, and then you've got um, all of your training. You know your trips and those flights and those hotels and that food. I mean, you're talking. To do it right, you're talking three, four, five hundred thousand dollars, like to raise. How do you get the boat from one place to another? Ship it in a shipping container, which is very expensive. Yeah, I like mean, on the ocean, like on it the can't, ocean. It, it can't be in a cargo bay of a airplane, can it? I've never done it that way. I, 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 I don't know anyone that has, but yeah, you literally you you rent one of those sixty foot cart containers. You uh, drive it in there in the trailer, you secure it, it gets put on a boat and it comes across. So, and so when you're going for sponsorship dollars, you're going, the, the, what is the, what is your pitch? I want to end with that. What, when yeah. you're, when you're raising money, what do you say to a company, to an individual, to somebody? I'm looking for philosophical alignment, you know, and I'm not looking for someone that just wants to put their logo on the boat. Cause that, by the way, that won't have a return for them. It's ocean rowing. It's not baseball. So, you know, like, you know, so you're looking at, at somebody who is wants to be part of the narrative, wants to be part of that story. My my sponsor of my first two rows, Carlisle, not the investment group, but Carlisle, the Rust Belt manufacturing company. You know, the CEO is the one who who signed up for it. He said, you know, I'm not interested in motivating everybody, all the executives that work with me. I'm talking about the 18,000 employees that work for Carlisle, they're trying to figure out how I'm going to put braces on my kids' teeth. How am I going to get them through college? I want a story of, you know, things that seem impossible that can be made possible. And that's why he sponsored it. That's why he gave the money. He wasn't looking, he's, they, they don't, they're B2B, you know, they're not even looking for recognition. People don't know who Carlisle is, but that's what he wanted. And that was a great lesson for me. That's how I, that's how I pitch. Now I have a leadership development company, so I can offer my leadership training courses to people, keynote speeches. I can, I can sweeten the package with education and that oftentimes helps as well. But mostly what people want is to be part of the narrative of something that seems impossible being made possible through these, these things. And that's, that's how I pitch. I love that. Do you pay your teammates? Um, we don't get, none of us get paid, but we'll take care of all their expenses. So that's how we do it. Did you pay for the flight home for the guy who bailed on you in the first race? Yeah, I think I did. <laughs> but you would I mean, not I, be I a good president remember. of a baseball team. Once they leave, see you later. <laughs> yeah, well, I can't, I can't remember. Might've been part of the, like the insurance, maybe the race paid for is, is part of our entry fee. I don't remember, but I can, I can almost assure you that he didn't pay for it himself. Is there an extra cost when you have to get evacuated? Do you have to pay for that boat to come? When you, when you watch Chasing the Documentary, one of the most interesting parts was this evacuation, which is scary, and it's real. It's not like a Spielberg movie. It's not Jaws. It's an actual, like, how do you get rescued from a rowboat in the middle of the ocean? Uh, and that has to have had a cost component, didn't it? Huge, and that's why the entry fee of these races, especially the Atlantic race is so high. And people think, Oh, I'm going to just do it on my own. I, I don't want to do it as a part of the race. Well, Atlantic campaigns, the, the, the race that we do at Atlantic is incredibly organized, you know, that they, 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 and they take care of lots of, so the minute we needed an evacuation, they sent a sailboat from the start line 
600 miles out to us with doctors on board and everything. That's what you're paying for. So when people say, I'm going to do it independent, I want to save the $30,000 entry fee. I'm like, you're a fool. You know, you need to make sure you got to do the safe. And by the way, you know, the, the, these things, if you can't do it the right way with the right equipment, you know, and, and extras of all that right equipment, then you can't afford to do this race. These people that do it on a shoestring budget, you're nuts. Well, by the way, there's no shortcuts. And that's part of what your motivational speaking is about. It's part of what we talk about all the time on this show. There are no shortcuts to success. You are not an overnight success, right? Just think about the process of the documentary that you just went through. It didn't all of a sudden get sold and all of a sudden everyone's watching it. And now, you know, you're, you're appearing on shows all over the country and the world. Things don't happen like that. There are no shortcuts to success. Everyone who you think is an overnight success, like when you see them win an Emmy or an Oscar, they've been toiling for years and years and years. And people don't want to put in that sweat equity. And that's the most important contribution to any business is the sweat equity. That's my view, at least. That is well said. I'm probably going to steal that from you and use that because it's absolutely 100% true. This was The documentary alone was two years of labor, hard labor, and we still haven't seen anything from it other than it's now out for people to see but we don't get any money for it and then and then you know not to mention all the rows so yeah i love it well listen you've we've gone over i really do appreciate your time i'd love to stay in touch i'd love to have you on the show again as we motivate our listeners to do things to make them uncomfortable i talk about another thing you can steal from me is i talk about uh having a stomach ache i love having stomach aches because it means i'm doing something that makes me uncomfortable and too many people are not willing to do that. They just want to live in their four corners, in their box, and they're not willing to ever go outside it And because they don't want to feel that way. And when you do the events that you do and, and some of the things that I do, by definition, you're going to feel that way. And what you do with that feeling is a great indicator of sort of what your life and what your life's path is going to be. So I search for the stomach ache, and I wonder whether do you do that? Yeah, I just say, you know, there's a – you know, being on the sidelines of life is just not interesting to me. And it's the same thing, just said a different way. It's like, I have to engage. And yeah, it, t it costs, you know, heartache and it costs friendship sometimes even, you know, it's a lot of things. It costs a lot, but um, I'm willing to go through with it because the alternative is to sit on the sidelines and watch everybody else do it. And that's just not interesting to me. You've been watching and listening to Jason Caldwell. Go get the documentary Chasing. Just trust me, get it. Jason, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate it. 